want to take a moment just to pray with you as we get ready to jump into a word tonight. Father, we just thank you that you are so faithful, God, that even in the face of circumstances we can't understand, like what's happened in Texas and in other places around our nation, God, you're still faithful. You're still able. You are the God of all comfort. And we just add our prayers again to Miss Susie's that you would go to every family member that's dealing with an unimaginable loss tonight, that you would comfort them, that you would love them, that you would be with them. God, tonight we ask that you would speak to us, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would speak clearly what you want us to hear in this place, that we would not leave here the same tonight, God, but that you, by your spirit and by your power, would change each one in this room tonight, God. We love you, we honor you, and we exalt the name above every name, the name of Jesus in this place. If you love Jesus, let me hear you say amen. Amen, you can be seated. I'm excited to be with you guys tonight. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mike, and I am just super amazingly over the top blessed and honored to be a part of the Way World Outreach. I can remember a time where I literally begged God to put me someplace where I could be used. And I'll tell you what, if you're at the Way World Outreach, you're going to get used by God. Um, I, I had a couple people ask me a question as, as they watched that giving video with, uh, I was there with Dominique. And they said, well, uh, your mom's a part of this church? And I said, yeah, my, mom's with, my mom was actually at this church before me. But I just want to take a moment to introduce my mama. That's my mom right there, Kathy Fondanova. Would you stand up? Single mom. Amazing woman of God, taught me just about everything I know about Jesus. Um, while I'm doing introductions, my brother's right there too. His, his name's Brian. He's helped. LU grad coming up. He's an LU intern. While we're doing shout outs, how about anybody from the way Pomona? Anybody from Pomona in here? Okay, how about uh, Arrowhead Campus? You in the house? I know we had a whole team out in uh, Compton, city of Compton. We've got a couple people out here. All right. So we got churches going up all over the place. I wanted to take a moment. We, shot, we saw a video earlier that showed the construction that's taking place on the school that you guys built. So I just, I'm amazed that our church gets to do something like this. But I want to show you some of the faces. I think I'm hoping we can show some of the faces. These are the kids that are in school right now at the Wayworld Outreach Kakamega Campus. These are some kids that are very dear to my heart. I miss them. I want to go back and see them. But as they're just showing a few pictures, all of these kids are right now in school because of our sacrificial giving at the Wayworld Hour. So, so proud of you guys. Give yourself a round of applause for everybody that supported that cause. And, you know, the enemy obviously wants to work so hard to steal from this generation. But it's nice to know that God is still at work all around the world, raising up a generation that will serve him and know him like these kids in Kenya. So I'm excited to be with you guys. I want to jump into this word. It's not going to be a long one because literally God gave me basically two sentences to share with you tonight. So that could be a good thing or a bad thing. I might decide to really expand on it or uh, we could just be out of here in five minutes. We'll see how it goes. But I want to start by um, just taking a moment to look at Colossians chapter 3. Now, I wish I could read uh, all of the chapter, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to go through a few things that it says here. It says in Colossians 3, since you've been raised to new life with Christ, so put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy for a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. I love this passage because it really portrays the life of a Christian. From beginning to end, it kind of paints a picture of the journey that each one of us takes. Now, I'm a big fan of travel. I just showed you some pictures of Kenya. I love, I love, love, love going to an airport and traveling. Recently, I had a dream where I was sitting in an airport uh, in a plane, and the plane was just not taking off. It was taking forever. And finally, at the end of this dream, I ended up in the cockpit, and we're taking off, and it was the fastest dream, uh, the fastest takeoff I'd ever experienced, and I was so excited. There's just something about planes and travel that I love. And tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about the journey, the journey that we take once we've committed our life to Christ. So let me share a couple of, of stories with you. First, my own story. 
When I, uh, when I was a young man, I was raised in church. I, I grew up in my grandparents' past, uh, my grandparents' church. They were pastors in Carson, of all places, just right next to Compton. Shout out to Compton again. Um, and as a young kid, I felt very called to the ministry. I wanted to be a pastor. I wanted to serve. Um, I remember words that went over my life as a very young age that I was going to go around the world and preach the gospel. But as a teenager, I really abandoned my call. I turned my back on God. There were some things in my life that caused me to feel like I didn't want to pursue God any further. And for most of my young adult life, I literally ran away from God. I was addicted to drugs. I was using uh, and abusing alcohol. I was in sexually immoral relationships. I was dominated by anger. I know some of you know me and you know my story, but there's quite a few here who don't. And so at the end of this almost 10-year run from God, I finally came to a point where I wasn't praying, God, get me out of this situation. God, help me to, uh, to just get out of this trouble that I'm in. But God, I want to change my life. And so I went into a church shortly after uh, being arrested. And um, I won't go into that whole story because it's kind of crazy. But after getting out of jail, I went almost immediately to a church that weekend. And I wish I could say that right there and then everything changed. But this is what I do know. Shortly thereafter, just a couple weeks or months later, there was a moment in a worship service, not unlike what we had tonight, where I raised my hands. And I'll never forget this moment because this is the moment that I encountered God in the most real way that I could ever possibly imagine. I raised my hands to God, probably for the first time in more than 10 years. And I said, God, I surrender my life to you. I give you my life. However you want me to live, I'm going to live. I want to live your way. And the love of God began to envelop me in such a real and tangible way. Has anyone ever encountered God's love like that? It was so real. I knew without a shadow of doubt that God was there, that he was surrounding me with love, that he was speaking into my heart. My son, I love you. And the thing that shattered my pride and blew my mind in that moment was I knew how far I had disqualified myself, how far I'd run from God. I didn't deserve the love that I was experiencing. And then God took it a step further and he said, and the things that I spoke over you as a child are still real. They're still valid. That promise to go preach the gospel around the world will take place. And I stand here today, a part of the Way World Outreach, and I've traveled to more than 20 countries to preach the gospel, not because I've got it all together, not because I'm a great man, not because there's anything special about Mike Fontenot but because there was a God who was willing to come into a moment of surrender and surround me with his love and speak life over me. I want to convince you, I want you to know tonight that one encounter with God can change your life forever. One encounter, one touch from Jesus Christ can change everything about you. Tonight, we're going to have a moment at the end of this service where we're going to give you an opportunity to experience God's touch, to encounter that love that will change everything. It's crazy. I love our church so much. One of the reasons I love our church is we'll do things like we're doing in just a week or two, a men's conference, a youth conference, a kids camp. We create places for people to meet God, to encounter him, to have their lives changed forever. Those are moments you do not want to miss. Those are moments where God can literally change your life forever. Tonight at the end of this service, if as I'm preaching tonight, as I'm sharing my testimony, something begins to stir in you, you recognize that need in yourself for a change, for an encounter with God. Do not delay, but come and to this place and meet God, a God who can change everything about you in one moment. But there's something interesting about God's way of working with us. Of course, it begins with a moment and begins with a change, but it also, as I mentioned, is a journey. And I want to talk about one encounter with God that can change your life and how obedience to God will define your life. The the title of the message is Changed. What is the title of the message? (laughs) Changed to Choose. I went through like three different uh, titles there. Change to choose. But let me tell you, um, just want to quickly go through two stories here. Two stories of men in the Bible that illustrate what I want to share tonight. 
First is the Apostle Paul. Now, those of you who don't know, the Apostle Paul is probably one of the most prolific authors of the New Testament. He's written more than half the New Testament. He's considered the father of the Christian church. Um, and he has kind of a crazy story. His story is kind of like mine in the sense that God did something that nobody expected, brought together a person who really had disqualified himself from being a Christian or from being loved by God or being used of God. This guy was literally going from place to place trying to find Christians to torture, imprison, and kill them. Just moments before Paul actually encounters Jesus, he's literally a part of stoning to death the first martyr of the Christian church, Stephen. And so we come across the story of Paul, which is pretty incredible. And Paul, ironically, his first name, his birth name was Saul. And the other person I want to tell a story about tonight is King Saul, Saul from the Old Testament. This is the first king of Israel. He's talked about in 1 Samuel, the book of 1 Samuel in the Old Testament. And Saul also has an interesting story. Both of these men encountered God in an incredible, tangible, life-altering way. But their lives did not end the same way. So let's take a look at first Paul's life. So as I mentioned, Paul, the terrorist, is on his way to Damascus. He's actually looking for people that he can imprison, Christians that he can imprison, that he can torture, that he can question and interrogate and possibly kill. And on his journey, he encounters God. The Bible records this story in Acts chapter 9 that a light from heaven comes down and blinds him and a voice from heaven begins to speak and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, Lord, who are you? And he says, this is Jesus of Nazareth who you've been persecuting. And for the first time in Saul's life, he recognizes and comes to the understanding that Jesus Christ was real. That Jesus Christ was not a fable made up by a bunch of people that were trying to lie or, or deceive or cause the, the Jewish church to, be, uh, to decline. He was actually encountering a real God that had a real plan for his life. And so he says, Lord, what do I do? He sends him to Damascus and he tells him to wait for a man to come and pray for him. And then he calls this man to go and pray. And the man who is called to go pray is a Christian. And he said, I'm not really excited to go pray for this guy that likes to kill Christians, Lord. And the Lord says, go anyway. And we'll pick up the story here in Acts chapter 9, verse 17 and 18. It's Ananias, the man who God's called to go pray for Saul. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I love this verse. Instantly. Something like scales fell from Saul's eye, and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Just a few verses later, people are watching Saul preach the gospel in total shock and amazement. They're saying, this man who was persecuting the church is now preaching. This man who is telling us how much of a fraud Jesus is, was, is now standing up and telling you that Jesus can change your life. Everything changed for Saul in just an instant. Those scales fell from his eyes. What are those scales in your life tonight? What are the things that God's trying to remove from your eyes? What are the things that God's trying to change inside of your heart? Is there some lie that you've been leaving and God is saying, I'm ready to set you free tonight if you'd only believe? It just takes one encounter with him to change everything. Another man who was changed by God, Saul, King Saul. Saul is a crazy story because Saul is a well-respected man in his society. He's actually, it says in the Bible, head and shoulders taller than everyone. In other words, everybody looked up to him. He was good looking. He was from the, one of the best families of the best tribes in Israel. And Samuel calls him out one day. Samuel's the leader of Israel at this time, the prophet, a judge. And he calls him out and says, you're going to be the king of Israel. Saul's shocked. But this is a crazy story of how Saul in this moment has his life completely changed by God. It's found in 1 Samuel chapter 10. And Samuel here speaking to Saul, he tells him, Saul, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to anoint you. You're going to become the king of Israel. 
And everything about you is going to change. It says right here in verse 6, At that time, the Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you, and you will prophesy with them. You will be changed into a different person. Just a few verses later, after Samuel's finished talking with Saul, verse 9 says, As Saul turned and started to leave, God gave him a new heart. And all of Samuel's signs were fulfilled that day. Has anybody ever gotten a new heart from God in this place? Maybe you're here tonight and you're thinking, you know, my heart hasn't been what it needs to be, Mike. I've been walking in some, some hardness. I've been walking in some doubt. I've been walking in some pain. I've been, I've been wondering where God is. I want you to know that tonight God can give you a brand new heart. He can take whatever hardness is there, whatever sin has been a part of your life, whatever doubt has been blocking you, and he can remove it and give you a brand new heart tonight. One encounter with God can change your life forever. Saul's life was changed. The Bible does not lie. It does not make up a fable. When it says it, it is something you can believe. So I know that Saul's life was truly changed by God here. He truly received a new heart. He truly was changed into a different person. But that encounter with God, though it changed his life for that moment, did not define how his life ended. One encounter with God can change your life forever, but obedience to God will define your life forever. I'm going to say that a couple times. This is literally the only sentence I have for you tonight. One encounter with God can change your life forever, but obedience to God will define your life forever. You see, we don't write stories or songs about how great Saul was anymore. We don't talk about what a great king he was because he wasn't a great king. Saul actually, from that place of prestige and power, went on to be one of the most evil kings in history. This guy who everyone respected actually went on to commit a genocide upon an entire people group. He decided he didn't like the fact that the Gibeonites had deceived Israel years before he'd ever been born, and so he tried to wipe them off the face of the earth. He literally tried to kill every single person in that race. That's the legacy of Saul. At the end of his life, he dies alone of suicide on a hilltop, surrounded by his enemies with three of his sons dead beside him. His life was not ended well. So what happened to Saul? Why is it that we see his life totally changed, transformed, he's given a new heart, but suddenly at the end of his life, the epitaph written over Saul's life is, not so good. Let's look at what happened to Saul. In 1 Samuel 15, 23, it identifies the problem with Saul. 1 Samuel 15, 23, rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. Because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. In other words, because you've rejected the command of the Lord, in other, you've disobeyed what God has asked you to do. You've been rejected as king. Your anointing is being taken from you. Your position, your role, the calling that God had in your life has been voided. That's powerful and that's painful. But let me just throw this other story of Saul out to you. This is the Saul of the New Testament. The Saul that becomes Apostle Paul. Saul who uh, becomes the man who literally leads the New Testament church into the greatest evangelism period in all of history. They take the gospel to every square corner of the known world at that time, led by Paul. A man who believes so much that even when people are begging him not to go to Jerusalem because he'll be tortured and uh, um, in jailed, and possibly executed, he says, I can't help but go because God has called me. I'm going to obey the word of the Lord at all costs. So he goes, and here at the end of his life in 2 Timothy, this is the, one of the, the very last things that Paul has to say. He's describing how his life's going to end. In 2 Timothy 4, 7 through 8, it says, I have fought the good fight. 
I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful, and now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return, and the prize is not just for me, (laughs) but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. Two things here, two stories, two men who literally had their lives changed by God in a moment, in an encounter with two very different conclusions to their life. What's the key? Well, it comes from Joshua 1.8. See, I want you to know that a life well lived, a successful life, is defined by obedience to God's word. One encounter with God can change your life forever, but obedience to God will define your life forever. One encounter with God will change your life forever, but obedience to God, will define your life forever. God speaking here in Joshua 1.8 to his uh, servant Joshua, another man who ends his life well, who has encounters with God that lead to a life well lived. Joshua 1.8, how did he do it? Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. I love this. Meditate on it day and night so you'll be sure to obey. Somebody say obey. Obey. I got another quote this week. I've been reading uh, Francis Chan's Crazy Love, and he quoted an author by the name of Annie Dillard who says, how we live our days is how we live our lives. How we live our days is how we live our lives. The daily choices you make will determine the course of your life. And it all comes back to obeying the word of the Lord, obeying his instructions, obeying his commands. As this verse says, success and prosperity come from meditating on this book of instruction, from studying it, from putting it into practice. I had a conversation uh, just a few few days ago, I guess a a little bit more than a week ago, with a a man who was struggling. He um, was very, very shaken up because he had just spent some time on YouTube watching videos about what hell is like. And, um, you know, I'm not going to comment on the wisdom of that or not. We definitely have had a few people that have come to our church, like Bill Weiss, who talked about his experiences in hell. And so we know that hell is a real place. The Bible talks about it. Jesus talks about it. Jesus talked about hell quite a bit. But this guy was watching some videos on hell, and he realized, he came to this conclusion that there was a possibility he might be headed that way. And he was very, very upset, and he came to me, and he said, I need to, I need to know what you think. I need to know if this is something that, if, if I'm going to hell. And the thing that really sh- shook him up and shaken him to the core was the fact that there was a video that said there was a place where homosexual offenders are in hell. This man was married to a man. He comes from a family of people who are married to the same sex. And he didn't know how to respond to that. There was this churning inside of him. And I could see just how much he was wrestling with this idea that he might be on his way to hell. And he wanted for for me to just give him some sort of relief. And I said, okay, you want to know if I think that homosexuality is a sin. But the first thing we have to establish is, do you believe that the Bible is God's word? And he couldn't answer that question. He looked at me. He said, well, I saw this and that. I studied this and that. I said, I I understand. But we have no basis to have a conversation about this. I can't have any. I, I don't have advice. I don't have counsel. I have nothing to offer you outside of this book. If you're not willing to say this book is the word of God, if you're not willing to say that in faith, that you'll believe that this is God speaking to us, giving us instruction, then there's nothing for me to say here. But if you're willing to say this is the book of instruction that God has given us on how to live, if you're willing to say this is God's word to me, if you're willing even to obey this word, then your life will be successful. Then you'll be prosperous. Then you'll be saved from the consequences of a life not lived by its instruction. You see, we have to establish that we're going to obey God's word. What, do I, what am I trying to drive at tonight? Well, this one encounter with God that can change your life forever, it's for a purpose. It's for a purpose. And that brings me back to the title of this message. It's 
a change, it's a transformation, it's an encounter with God that sets you free to choose how you're going to live your life. We are a deliverance church. We have classes about deliverance. We help people get set free every week, every service. People come, they're demonized. They have all kinds of things going on in their life that they're almost out of complete control over. I, I, I have this compulsive sin. I can't stop. I can't stop looking at pornography. I can't stop drinking. I can't stop drugs. I can't stop beating my wife. I can't stop screaming and shouting at my husband. I can't stop. There's just something inside of me. It takes over. I don't know how to get past it. It just keeps happening. That's called a stronghold. It's called demonic activity. And when people get set free, when they encounter Jesus, seeing this begins to change. This stronghold can be broken in your life. And it doesn't happen because of anything great about you or anything that you've done. It's all because Jesus paid a price 2,000 years ago so that you could be set free from the slavery of sin, from the bondage of sin. So you could be set free from the demons that have come into your life, whether it's through your sin or through family lines or whatever the case may be, but you can be set free. But get this, the Bible's very clear also that you then have to choose. So what happens in that moment when you're set free? You're given the power to choose what you're going to do. You're no longer bound and enslaved to that thing anymore. Now you have the power to choose. Galatians 5.1 says, so Christ has truly set you free. Christ has truly set us free, excuse me. No, now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. I love that verse because it talks about where the responsibility lies. The responsibility is on us. God sets us free and then we make sure to stay free. Choosing to obey Choosing to obey God's clearly revealed commands will allow us to learn of him and give us wisdom for the great areas. Now, I, I mentioned a gentleman that came in, and he wanted to talk about a specific sin that's very clearly outlined in the, in the Bible. But there are some things that maybe you're not clear on. What am I supposed to do with my life? What is my calling? Where am I supposed to go? Am I supposed to go to... Uh, Kenya this year? Am I supposed to do something uh, for another missions trip? Am I supposed to serve with the hospitality team? Am I supposed to be a greeter? Am I supposed to, God, what am I supposed to do? There's some things like that that aren't always clearly outlined in the Bible. It doesn't say in there, Mike, you need to go to the Wayworld Outreach and, and serve at that church, right? But this is the thing. When we begin to obey God's word, when we begin to apply the clearly outlined and revealed principles that are in the Bible, you'll begin to know him. You'll begin to understand him. You'll begin to hear his voice. The Bible says that you're, you're, you'll become a sheep who knows the voice of the shepherd. Jesus said it this way in John 14, 21. The person who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who really loves me. And whoever really loves me will be loved by my father. And I will love him and reveal myself to him. I love the Amplified. It says, I will make myself real to him. In other words, the more that we obey... The more that we choose obedience, the more that we know God, the more that we understand what he wants to do with our lives, the more that we get a picture of what he's asking us to do and how he's going to do it and what we're supposed to do in every situation. Now, I'm not saying there are moments where we don't understand or we don't have a clear picture of what's going on, but even then, God said, I'll comfort you, I'll be with you, I'll walk with you if you'll only walk in obedience. So salvation... The encounter with God is our starting point. Tonight, we're about to, we're about to invite people up here just now. I'm going to, actually, the worship team can come. We're, we're going to bring this to a close in just a minute. But tonight, I want you to know that salvation, coming to an encounter with God, is just the starting point. It's not the finish line. We do people a disservice when we tell them all you need to do is come and pray a prayer and you're going to be saved forever and you're all good. I'm not to say, I'm not here to talk about once saved, always saved or not. That's not my debate. I'm here to tell you that when you're saved, you now get to start the greatest journey of your life. You get to do all that God has called you to do. You get to walk in a freedom that you've longed to walk in. 
You know, my, my testimony I shared just a little bit earlier, I was, one of the things that really drove me crazy was my life was meaningless. I went every day to a financial office and made money and then went home and ate and worked out and went to sleep and did the same thing over again the next day. I had no purpose, no meaning. There was nothing exciting about my life. And I remember sitting on a train on my way to work one morning and saying, there just has to be more. And I want you to know that the more that you're looking for is found in an encounter with God where he changes everything about you and he breaks off the chains of slavery, the chains of bondage, the chains of sin in your life, and you're set free again to choose to obey and to walk and to journey with him towards a destiny you've always longed for. 2 Corinthians 3, 16 and 18 says, But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away, for the Lord is spirit. And wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of God and the Lord, who is the spirit, makes us more and more like him as we're changed into his glorious image. It's not always a one-time thing, guys. The one time, that encounter with God, that that moment of change then becomes a journey towards knowing him better, towards seeing him more clearly, to walking in one day until you're done with this life and you walk into the other side and you see him face to face and he's not a stranger to you. He's not someone you've never met before. He's not saying, I'm sorry, have I met? You know him and he knows you. It's like the best reunion you've ever had in your whole life because you chose a journey to knowing him better, a journey to being who he called you to be. Tonight, I want to encourage you all to choose. Choose to stay free like Galatians 5.1 said. Choose to have the veil removed from your eyes tonight. The veil in, in 2 Corinthians is actually talking about a veil that keeps you from understanding God's word. It keeps you from understanding what the Bible is instructing us to do. And Jesus can remove that veil. The God of the Bible wants to remove that veil from every one of your hearts tonight and allow you to understand his word, to understand his instruction, because one encounter with God can change your life forever. And what does it do? It enables you to understand his word. It enables you to choose to obey. It enables you to walk with him like you've never walked before. Some of us sometimes get caught up on, on all that we have to do and I just want to reassure you, it's, it's not that you come up here and then you get saved and then you got to white knuckle it till eternity. You don't have to work really, really hard to know God. Philippians 2.13 says, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. You might be sitting here tonight thinking, I don't know if I can do it, Mike. I've been trying so hard. I've been trying to obey. I really have, Mike. Don't be so hard on me. I, I basically just read scriptures tonight, so I'm not trying to be hard on you, but I, I want you to know that if you're feeling that way, that's not from God. God wants to give you the desire to change. God wants to give you the power to do it, and he wants to do it tonight. He wants to give you an encounter that could change everything about you, that could change your heart, that could change the things that you think about. And it starts just by saying, yeah, I want that. I want that change. I want that encounter. I want to be a part of what God wants to do in my life. I want to surrender. If you notice my prayer in my moment of surrender to God, it was not, God, get me out of this. God, God, um, I, I, I really want to uh, be a Christian today. It was, God, I'm surrendering my way. I'm giving up my will. I'm saying, God, whatever you want me to do, I'm going to do. And when you come with that attitude, when you say, God, whatever you want, however you want to do it, it doesn't matter if I understand how it's going to happen. I'm just going to trust that you're going to do it, God. He'll do what he wants to do in your life, which is to change everything, to change your heart, to give you the power to obey, to give you the understanding of his word so that you can walk through life no longer alone, no longer sitting on a train thinking there has to be more to life than this. Tonight I want to have us all stand together. I want to give an opportunity to two types of people tonight. Maybe you've never experienced what we talked about tonight. Maybe you've never encountered God like that. And please, in this moment, I would ask that you stay 
You remain here. Do not walk out of the room if you don't have to. We really, really, really want to be respectful of this moment. This is a moment where someone's life, someone's eternity can be changed forever. If you're already saved in this place, this is the moment for you to start praying. I need you to pray. I need you to intercede. I need you to start binding some of those demonic strongholds that have kept people bound. I need you to start praying that someone in this room would have their life changed forever. But if you're a somebody who has not experienced, not encountered the presence of God in a tangible, in a real, in a life transformative way, I want you to come tonight and experience what only God can do. The change that you've been longing for begins with His power. It begins with His touch. It begins with surrender to Him. Tonight, you just need to say, yes, God, I surrender. I want to live your way. If you're one of those people tonight and you're saying, I need to experience that. I want to know God's encounter. I want to, I want to know His power changing my life. I want you to raise your hand in this place. Raise your hand if you're ready to experience God change your life forever. I see your hands. I see your hands. Thank you. I see your hands. God's going to do it. He's going to change you. Raise your hands up. Keep them high. I see that hand. God's going to change your life. God can do anything he wants in one moment. And he's going to change your life tonight. The second group of people are those that said, you know what, Mike? I had my life changed. I experienced God before. I've been saved, Mike. I know what it's like to experience what you talked about tonight where God's love surrounds me and, and I knew that God was real, but there's been a change. I haven't, I haven't done what I was supposed to do. I know I keep, I keep going back. I keep letting myself get entangled again into things that I don't want to be entangled in. If you're one of those people here tonight, if you're one of those people that's saying, I, I just need... God to change me again. I need him to empower me again. I need to start over. Then I want you to raise your hand in this place. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. It starts with humility. It starts with admitting, I need God. I need him tonight. I can't do this without him. I need him to change my life. If you raise your hand for either of those things, I want you to come forward. Allow our team to pray with you. Allow us to let you experience what only God can do. Come forward right now and have these people pray with you. Would you guys give them a round of applause as they come? Come on down. It's time for God to change your life forever. It's time for God to change your life forever. It's time for you to be set free so that you can obey and you can walk the calling out that you've been given, the purpose that God has for you, the destiny. Come on down. If you're ready for that destiny, if you're ready for that purpose, if you're ready for a life that's lived in obedience to God, the best life you'll ever live, the life you've longed for, I want you to come down right now. They're still coming, folks. Would you clap? Would you cheer? All of heaven is cheering for every one of these people as they come. All of heaven is going in crazy for each one of these people. Tonight's the night. You're going to be set free so that you can choose to obey, so that you can walk with Jesus all the days of your life. We're going to say a prayer together. We're going to say a prayer together with each of the altar team here. And then they're going to pray for you individually. If you're out there still and you're thinking, I need to be down there, get down here. Come down right now. No one's stopping you. We want you to be here. We want you. I know there's one or two that are hesitant. They're saying, I'm not sure if I'm ready. Don't hesitate. Surrender your life. You're tired of living that way. You've been tired of it for a long time. Come down now. Let's pray a prayer together. A prayer of surrender. A prayer to ask God to change everything about us. Let's pray. Father, repeat after me. Father, I surrender. I give you my life. I want to live your way. I want to be set free so that I can walk in obedience to you, in obedience to your word. Help me, God. Change me tonight. Give me a new heart and help me 
to walk this journey out as you would have me do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you give these people a round of applause who just committed their life to Christ? We're so proud of every one of you guys. Stay here with the altar team. They're going to pray with you. They're going to help you get your next step. We love you guys. We're so glad that every one of you is here. Don't forget, next Wednesday is Way Back Wednesday. We're going to have a throwback service outdoors here at Hallmark Campus. we got men's conference, youth conference, all kinds of encounter moments. So don't miss those moments. As you go out today, we love you, we bless you. We look forward to seeing you again this weekend.